Hi everyone, Amer back with another Mission Impossible episode review. This time I'm doing Season 5, Episode 6, which is called My Friend, My Enemy. So this one starts with Paris driving a motorbike through what is supposed to be the Alps, I guess. Uh, there's a signpost for a city named Arldens, which doesn't actually exist, I looked it up. A uh, car follows him down the windy road with a guy in the back, who we later learn is Carl Moore, alerting an accomplice down the road to be ready. The car forces Paris off the road, and the accomplice shoots Paris with a dart of some sort. Moore gets his henchman to take Paris away, saying they have a special purpose for him, and tossing the motorcycle's headlight away. Paris is taken to a facility where we meet Dr. Tabor, who learns from Moore that he spotted Paris by accident in Innsbruck, recognizing him after some incident the year before in which Moore was caught. Paris is drugged and questioned, not revealing any answers about the IMF, the mission he just completed, or his status as an agent. Jim and Dana are waiting in Geneva for him and worrying that he should have arrived many hours ago. And Jim mobilizes Doug and Barney to head over to Europe. Tabor gets Paris to reveal under hypnosis that he never really knew his mother as his father drove her away when he was very young. We also see that Tabor has apparently implanted an electrode in an army corporal's dog who becomes violent on seeing his owner. Tabor then questions Paris about a magician he learned from many years ago who had a lovely assistant named Inga, and the magician killed her in a jealous rage. Tabor takes the role of the magician and tells Paris to kill him. This is all under hypnosis. But Paris has strong inhibitions against murder, and Tabor sedates him to prepare him for a similar implant procedure, with the idea that he can be manipulated to kill his control agent if he is made to believe that he will again lose someone he loves. We next see Paris, dressed as he was previously, arriving at an inn, and he calls Jim in Geneva, saying he had an accident and is going to stay at the inn for a while to relax. Tabor and a security officer named Bandar arrive behind him and reserve a cabin. Jim mobilizes a team to go through standard clearance procedure for Paris and retrace his steps. Paris arrives in his room with Tabor and Bandar not far away. They activate their relay device, which uh, triggers the implant and causes Paris some pain that he can't understand, and he has a troubled flashback dream of the magician killing Inga. Later in the main lounge, Paris spots a lovely young blonde named Enid Bruga. Jim arrives as a tourist bird watcher and sends Paris a message in Morse code, tapping on his cane and then heading out, with Paris following and Tabor watching intently. So Barney and Dana find Paris's motorcycle, and no fingerprints are found other than what would be expected. But Barney wonders about where the headlight ended up. Doug clears Paris medically, but Jim is concerned about how Paris was forced off the road and the car didn't stop to see if he was okay. Paris shows weird signs of being agitated of having to go through the clearance procedure, but realizes must be done and everybody's just looking out for his best interests. That evening at the lounge, Paris chats up Enid and they have a dance which becomes an awesome use of TV time, as Jim, Tabor, and Bandar watch on. Paris enjoys himself until he sees Inga's face on Enid suddenly, and then gets momentarily disturbed but recovers. When Enid returns to her cabin, Tabor congratulates her on her work so far. The next day, the two spend more time together, with Paris continuing to have the flashbacks. Barney and Dana find the headlight with Moore's fingerprints on it and relay the information to Jim, who says that they should track down Moore at his new job at a trade commission in Vienna and tells them that they found some dog hair on Paris, which could be a clue. Dana goes into the Trade Commission with a special dog whistle and is taken to Moore's office. On the way there, she activates a whistle and hears a dog barking loudly, paying close attention to some of the things around the building. Paris tells Jim he still feels really strange and can't explain it, and Jim tells him the bad news that he was indeed compromised. Jim also says that Enid is an agent, and Paris says she told him that, but she intends to defect. Jim warns him that it could be a trap. Bandar tells Tabor that he tried to follow Paris, but couldn't track him all the way to his destination. Paris is too careful. So Tabor activates the device again, triggering more pain for a moment. When Jim asks him again about Enid's sudden appearance, Paris gets really upset and for a moment sees Jim as the magician, accusing Jim of wanting Enid for himself and angrily warns him to stay away from her. 
So Jim tells Doug to join Barney and Dana on her next trip to the uh, Trade Commission. You'll see what happens. And the two men climb upstairs using a grappling hook as Dana goes back to Moore's office, having left her purse behind by accident, which she says has her asthma medication. Dana puts her purse on the window ledge, triggering an alarm to cover up the sound of Barney and Doug, removing the glue from a roof window and gaining entry. They find the electrode in the dog's head as Dana apologizes for the trouble and leaves. Removing the electrode from the dog and examining it, Doug realizes that Paris must have a similar one embedded in the palate in his mouth, so it couldn't be detected. The night That night... Tabor and Bandar come to Enid's room, saying that they will stage her getting shot by Paris's control. Enid calls Paris and says that she was threatened by a man not to see him anymore. She's afraid. Bandar's shot turns out to be a live round, and unfortunately Enid is killed for real, with Tabor saying that the fake wouldn't have fooled Paris. Paris comes to Enid's room and finds her dead, with Tabor activating the final phase of the pain cycle. Paris again sees Inga in Enid's face, and Doug and Barney report to Jim that Paris needs to get to a hospital pronto to get the implant removed. Jim runs to find Paris, who sees him as a magician again, and takes two shots at him. Jim gets away and is able to grab a hold of Paris, but Paris is able to elbow him off. Jim tells Paris to fight what he's feeling as Tabor and Bandar arrive on the scene. With Tabor ordering Bandar to shoot Jim, but fortunately Paris shoots Bandar first due to his own internal impulses, and Tabor's plan is defeated. The IMF is reunited, and fortunately, Max the dog starts to recover as well. I'm going to give this episode a grade of D. Boy, where, where, where to begin with this one? Let me start, as usual, with the good. I liked the action at the Trade Commission, where Dana goes in and um, kind of does this very subtle but effective um, casing of the place to to determine things. You don't you don't really see it at first, and actually I kind of missed it, where Dana is just kind of watching her surroundings, and she notices that the elevator has a little uh, a, a, a lock. Uh, to go up to the fourth floor. And so she figures, okay, that must be kind of a secret or, you know, restricted area. She notices the alarm or alarm triggers on the window ledges in Moore's office, which she uses later to allow Doug and Barney to get in. And, and all of that action there, that was pretty good quality stuff. And I'll discuss that further as we go. Also good, the guest stars are okay, but I don't really see... I had a problem with the fact that their their, their roles were very, very kind of one-dimensional. Uh, Peter Mark Richmond, we've seen him before, we'll see him again. You know what you're going to get with this guy. You're going to get a guy that just, ha just you know, oozes, you know, self-confidence and is like never wrong and, 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 is just, and just thinks that he's invincible and unbeatable. Um... And Jill Hayworth as Enid, I mean, she's okay, I guess, um, but, you know, her, her role like, is also very, very limited. So, I mean, I, I, there's really not a whole heck of a lot to say about her. Not her fault, that's just the way that the script is. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I guess that's what I can say about the guest stars. Um, I... I like, and I'm going to present this as kind of a point-counterpoint, the show is based on a neat premise, um, on the idea that, you know, the IMF finally has a situation where they took somebody down, um, an enemy spy, an enemy agent, and then suddenly they cross paths again. Uh, Carl Moore see, finds Paris again during another mission. And that, and so the whole set of events in this episode unfolds. That that's actually kind of a neat idea, and the IMF do revisit that in uh, in an episode in the final season. But the counterpoint to that is that Carl Moore. <laughs> I'm sorry, but for him to be so careless as to leave fingerprints at the scene by handling the headlight of Paris's motorcycle, that's just colossally stupid. Uh, you know, he, he as, a, as a spy, he more than almost anybody should know 
what's going to happen. The IMF is just not going to leave it alone. American intelligence is not just going to leave it alone. They're going to investigate. Why would he take that risk? Uh, that, that, that's, that, that to me was just really, really bad. So, so basically it kind of frames this whole episode as kind of an idiot plot <laughs> because more is just, just, just really, really, really stupid that way. Let's move on to the rest of kind of what is bad here, in my opinion. This episode reminds me, how can it not, of Lovers Not back in season four. And I have to face palm just at the thought of that episode. I'm sorry. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to promise not to get angry <laughs> like I did in that episode. But it does remind me of that. Um, Gil Hayworth is far superior as a romantic interest, I guess, for Paris than Jane Merrill was in that episode. How could she not be? But again, the romantic subplot really doesn't even matter. It's inconsequential in this episode, which is really, really too bad. And frankly, the time that is spent on it, I really don't think is, is spent too wisely. It's not as horrible as I seem to recall, where you know a lot of stupid television minutes were wasted on it, but still, it, 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 it wasn't good. Like in Lover's Knot, I commented on the way that Leonard Nimoy emoted in terms of, you know, the struggles he was having. I find that he does it very much in, in, in the same way. Um, and, and that kind of makes me wonder, because I thought in that episode that he was doing it because that's how he was being directed, that he's actually emoting as he believed that Paris would. Now, maybe he's doing the same thing here, but now I kind of wonder, boy, is that is that kind of how Nimoy emotes, or is he really playing his character? I don't know. Um, in this episode, I also feel that his emoting is a lot more, I, I don't know what other word to say, it, he seems way more emo, if, if you understand that term. Um, I don't know if if, uh, if people outside of North America understand that term, but 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 we refer here in Canada and the United States to um, especially teens, you know, that have a lot of angst and they think that the whole world is is, is you know chaotic and bad and that sort of thing and you know woe is me and all of that and you know they sometimes dress in black like goth kids and stuff like that. I kind of think of. Um, you know, in, in Star Wars, in the recent movies, if you think of Kylo Ren, uh, that, that's kind of what it reminds me of, of about him just kind of like lashing out and blaming the world for all of the bad things that are going on. And, you know, oh, this is terrible. And, you know, why is this happening? And all, all of that. I, it, it, it really, really bothered me. It really did. Um, everything about episodes like this has a problem because this is an episode that focuses on or, or you know revolves around I guess is a better way to say it what's going on inside a person's head um, it rem that reminds me kind of the episode the final episode of season three the interrogator where you know the, the whole point of, of that was the IMF getting inside a guy's head and trying to get information out of it those uh, Shows based on that kind of premise are problematic. They never seem to turn out really, really. They never seem to turn out well. That that's my opinion about that. The whole episode is strained and gloomy, um, and, and 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 again, there's just a vibe that I don't like. I I really really had to think about why I felt that way about it, but I. As I kind of thought it out, here's my feeling. In just about every single episode, even the personal missions, and then you could consider this to be kind of like a personal mission. You know, the IMF is not given instructions. There's not like an official mission here. But even in those other personal missions, the IMF is acting. They are trying to run the show and they are trying to run a plan. Here, they are reacting rather than acting. That's the big problem, I feel, with this episode. They're just trying to see, okay, well, we're just going to have to do this, and let's see what Paris does. 
or how Paris reacts to it or what, what we get out of it. The only exception would be what I already mentioned. The, when the IMF, uh, you know, goes into the Trade Commission to get information and kind of, you know, solve the mystery, so to speak. That part of it is good. But the rest of it all is, is it, it all revolves around the IMF reacting rather than acting. And I think that this is the real big problem of this episode. Um, one last thing I'm going to mention. I was really bothered, uh, again, with my, you know, brief training about this whole concept of a kill center, especially in what, in what the, we, is referred to here as the lateral hypothalamus. Um, the, I thought that, you know, this is preposterous. First of all, there is no such thing as a kill center. Um, and the hypothalamus, uh, in humans and other animals, you know, regulates things like, 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 like hunger and thirst and temperature and that sort of thing. What I found was in doing a little bit of research about it, just to confirm that, is that that is indeed correct, but they, but people didn't know that in the 1970s. Uh, it was only in the 80s that this was kind of disproved and debunked. So in the 1970s, uh, this episode is from uh, uh, around the turn of the decade, um, it, that would not have been known. And it was, it, it was a sort of, uh, I wouldn't say common knowledge, but accepted knowledge in the scientific and medical community that, that, that the kill center was actually a thing. So I can't really fault um, the, the writers and producers for kind of going with that. We didn't know any better at the time. Um, just thought I would throw that out there. Anyway, I'm going to stick by my grade of a D for this one. Um, as always, please like this review. Please like this video. Please subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. We're getting more subscribers, and I really, really appreciate everyone who has subscribed. I hope to see the numbers continue to rise. And um, please leave your comments about this video, about what you thought about it. I'd love to hear what you have to say, as always. Thank you again, and I'll see you next time.